The 26th of March, 1945. On their way to central Germany, US Army units liberate Hartemar, a psychiatric clinic and one of the six killing facilities in the Nazi so-called euthanasia program. They come upon catastrophic conditions. Over 500 patients are starved and weakened by systematic neglect and targeted malnutrition. Although the US Army provides medical care and additional rations to these patients, for many, the help is too late. As a result of inadequate care, several of them die in the days and weeks following the liberation. The US Army launches an investigation immediately after the liberation, and the key members of the hospital management that are still on site are taken into custody and interrogated. Among the staff arrested by the Americans is the Hadamas chief physician and medical director. His name is Adolf Wallmann. Adolf Wallmann was born on the 10th of December, 1876, in koblenz ehrenbreitstein then part of the German Empire. After graduating high school in Laubach in 1897, he studied medicine in various German cities, including Gießen, Marburg, Erlangen, and Kiel. He completed his studies with his dissertation in 1903. As a young assistant doctor, Wallmann was employed at the Maxhausen State Sanatorium until 1905, where in the same year he also received his specialist qualifications as a psychiatrist. From 1905 until 1906, he worked at the Weilmunster State Sanatorium and then at the Eichberg State Sanatorium until 1908. Wallmann interrupted his work at the Eichberg State Sanatorium to serve as a chief physician at the Hadamar State Sanatorium from 1908 to 1911. He then returned to Eichberg, where he remained until 1933. The director of the Eichberg State Sanatorium and Wallmann's brief superior, Wilhelm Hinsen, characterized Wallmann as a gifted man who had been very popular with his patients, and because he behaved better to his patients than to his staff, he earned the nickname Jesus Christ among the staff at the Weilmunster Institution. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party came into power in January 1933. On the 1st of April the same year, Wallmann joined the Nazi party, and one year later, in 1934, he became a member of the SS. Many of Nazi Germany's racial policies were shaped by racial hygiene. Medical professionals implemented many of these policies and targeted individuals the Nazis defined as hereditarily ill, those with mental, physical, or social disabilities. The Nazis claimed that these individuals placed both a genetic and financial burden upon society and the state. Nazi authorities resolved to intervene in the reproductive capacities of persons classified as hereditarily ill. One of the first eugenic measures they initiated was the 1933 law for the prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases, the Hereditary Health Law. The law mandated forcible sterilization for nine disabilities and disorders, including schizophrenia and hereditary feeble-mindedness. As a result of the law, 400,000 Germans were ultimately sterilized in Nazi Germany. In addition, eugenic beliefs shaped Germany's 1935 marital hygiene law. This law prohibited the marriage of persons with diseased, inferior, or dangerous genetic material to healthy German Aryans. Eugenics not only provided the basis for the Nazi compulsory sterilization policy, but it also underpinned the murder of the institutionalized disabled in the clandestine euthanasia program. The euthanasia program was the systematic murder of institutionalized patients with disabilities in Germany. It predated the genocide of European Jewry, the Holocaust, by approximately two years, and was one of many radical eugenic measures which aimed to restore the so-called racial integrity of the German nation. It aimed to eliminate what eugenicists and their supporters considered life unworthy of life. According to the Nazis, those individuals, because of severe psychiatric, neurological, or physical disabilities, represented both a genetic and a financial burden on German society and the state. In the spring and summer months of 1939, several planners began to organize a secret killing operation targeting disabled children. They were led by Philip Böhler, the director of Hitler's private chancellery, and Karl Brandt, Hitler's attending physician. 
On the 18th of August 1939, the Reich Ministry of the Interior circulated a decree requiring all physicians, nurses, and midwives to report newborn infants and children under the age of three who showed signs of severe mental or physical disability. Beginning in October 1939, public health authorities began to encourage parents of children with disabilities to admit their young children to one of several specially designated pediatric clinics throughout Germany and Austria. In reality, the clinics were children's killing wards. There, specially recruited medical staff murdered their young charges by lethal overdoses of medication or by starvation. At first, medical professionals and clinic administrators included only infants and toddlers in the operation. But as the scope of the measure widened, they included youths up to 17 years of age. Conservative estimates suggest that at least 10,000 physically and mentally disabled German children perished as a result of the child euthanasia program during the war years. However, euthanasia planners quickly envisioned extending the killing program to adult disabled patients living in institutional settings. In the autumn of 1939, Adolf Hitler signed a secret authorization in order to protect participating physicians, medical staff, and administrators from prosecution. This authorization was backdated to the 1st of September 1939 to suggest that the effort was related to wartime measures. The Führer Chancellery was compact and separate from state, government, or Nazi party apparatuses. For these reasons, Hitler chose it to serve as the engine for the euthanasia campaign. The program's functionaries called their secret enterprise T4. According to Hitler's directive, Führer Chancellery Director Philipp Berler and physician Karl Brandt led the killing operation. Under their leadership, T4 operatives established six gassing installations for adults as part of the euthanasia action. These were Brandenburg on the Havel River near Berlin, Grafeneck in southwestern Germany, Bamberg in Saxony, Sonnenstein also in Saxony, Hartheim near Linz on the Danube in Austria, and Hadamar in Hessen, where Adolf Wallmann worked as a chief physician. Using a practice developed for the child euthanasia program in the autumn of 1939, T4 planners began to distribute carefully formulated questionnaires to all public health officials, public and private hospitals, mental institutions, and nursing homes for the chronically ill and aged. The limited space and wording on the forms, as well as the instructions in the accompanying cover letter, combined to give the impression that the survey was intended simply to gather statistical data. The categories for the patients were those suffering from schizophrenia, epilepsy, dementia, encephalitis, and other chronic psychiatric or neurological disorders, those not of German or related blunt, the criminally insane, or those committed on criminal grounds, and those who had been confined to the institution in question for more than five years. Secretly recruited medical experts, physicians, many of them of significant reputation, worked in teams of three to evaluate the forms. On the basis of their decisions, beginning in January 1940, T4 functionaries began to remove patients selected for the euthanasia program from their home institutions. The patients were transported by bus or by rail to one of the central gassing installations for killing. Within hours of their arrival at such centers, the victims perished in gas chambers. The gas chambers, disguised as shower facilities, used pure, bottled carbon monoxide gas. T4 functionaries burned the bodies in crematoria attached to the gassing facilities. Other workers took the ashes of the cremated victims from a common pile and placed them in urns to send to the relatives of the victims. The families or guardians of the victims received such an urn, along with a death certificate and other documentation listing a fictitious cause and date of death. In the first phase of the killing operations, between January and August 1941, around 10,000 men, women and children were asphyxiated with carbon monoxide in Hadamar's gas chamber made to look like a shower room. The victims murdered at Hadamar Psychiatric Hospital were brought in by train and great buses. The victims were sent before the physicians, such as Adolf Wallmann, who identified each person with a different colored sticking plaster for one of three categories, murder, murder and removal of brain for research, and murder and extraction of gold teeth. When in the summer of 1941, the staff celebrated the cremation of their 10,000th patient, they celebrated with beer and wine. 
since the crematorium ovens were often filled with two corpses at a time. The cremation process was less than perfect, which often resulted in a thick, acrid smog that hung over the town. Because the program was secret, T4 planners and functionaries took elaborate measures to conceal its deadly designs. Even though physicians and institutional administrators falsified official records in every case to indicate that the victims died of natural causes, the euthanasia program quickly became an open secret. There was widespread public knowledge of the measure. Private and public protests concerning the killings took place, especially from members of the German clergy. Among these clergy was the Bishop of Munster, Clemens August Count von Galen. He protested the T4 killings in a sermon on the 3rd of August, 1941. Considering the widespread public knowledge and the public and private protests, Hitler ordered a halt to the euthanasia program in late August, 1941. According to T4's own internal calculations, the euthanasia effort claimed the lives of 70,273 institutionalized mentally and physically disabled persons at the six gassing facilities between January 1940 and August 1941. However, Hitler's call for a halt to the T4 action did not mean an end to the euthanasia killing operation. Child euthanasia continued as before. Moreover, in August 1942, German medical professionals and healthcare workers resumed the killings, although in a more careful and concealed manner than before. More decentralized than the initial gassing phase, the renewed effort relied closely upon regional exigencies, with local authorities determining the pace of the killing. Using drug overdose and lethal injection, already successfully used in child euthanasia, in this second phase as a more COVID means of killing, the euthanasia campaign resumed at a broad range of institutions throughout the Reich. Many of these institutions also systematically starved adult and child victims. Hadamar was no exception. From August 1942 to the 24th of March 1945, approximately 4,420 persons died at Hadamar. Resident physicians and staff directly killed most of these victims, among whom were German patients with disabilities, mentally disoriented elderly persons from bombed out areas, half Jewish children from welfare institutions, psychologically and physically disabled forced laborers and their children. German soldiers and foreign Waffen SS soldiers deemed psychologically incurable. The medical personnel and staff at Hadamar killed almost all of these people by lethal drug overdoses and deliberate neglect. The euthanasia program continued until the last days of World War II, expanding to include an ever wider range of victims, including geriatric patients, bombing victims, and foreign forced laborers. Historians estimate that the euthanasia program, in all its phases, claimed the lives of 250,000 individuals. On the 26th of March 1945, on their way to central Germany, the US Army units reached the town of Hadamar and liberated the town and the institution. Hadamar was one of the first major murder sites to be liberated by the US Army. The obvious traces left by the murder of the ill led to the first US Army investigation that began immediately after liberation. The key members of hospital management that were still on site were taken into custody and interrogated. Witnesses were also questioned about the murders and evidence was seized. Adolf Wallmann, then chief physician of the hospital, was among the staff arrested by the Americans. The evidence gathered during the investigation led to a first trial in October 1945. It was conducted in a US military court in Wiesbaden against the staff members that undertook the killings. Adolf Wallmann was tried with several other staff members of the Hadamar Institution. Among them were Alfons Klein, the former director of the institute, as well as two male nurses, Heinrich Ruoff and Karl Willich. The three Klein, Ruoff, and Willich were sentenced to death and went to the gallows on the 14th of March, 1946. During the trial, Wallmann tried to downplay his role in the Nazi party and his devotion to Nazi ideology. He argued that he was a devout Christian and leader of a church choir, and he was as much a musician as a doctor. He added, the reason he had joined the Nazi party in 1933 was because everyone else had done so. He did not accept any party posts because it would have irritated him and prevented him from devoting his free time to music and church. 
He argued that, in fact, he had various difficulties with the Nazi party, especially because he had stayed away from party meetings, since he did not want to miss his church choir. His lies, however, did not help him escape justice. On the 15th of October, 1945, Valmont was sentenced to life imprisonment by a US military court for the murder of Polish forced laborers. In 1947, Valmann was also among the 25 persons tried at the later German convened Hadamard trial, which involved German nationals who had participated in the murder of thousands of their fellow citizens. In its verdict of the 26th of March, 1947, the Frankfurt Regional Court sentenced Valmann to death for murder in at least 900 cases. In the appeal proceedings before the Higher Regional Court of Frankfurt, the verdict was confirmed, but it was now found to be incitement to murder instead of complicity as before. However, after the Basic Law came into force on the 23rd of May 1949 and the death penalty was abolished, the sentence was amended to life imprisonment. In 1953, due to his age, Valmont was pardoned and moved to the town of Michelfeld in Baden-Württemberg, where he lived until his death. When Adolf Wallmann died on the 1st of November 1956, he was 79 years old. There were no tears shed for Adolf Wallmann. Thanks for watching the World History Channel. Be sure to like and subscribe, and click the bell notification icon so you don't miss our next episodes. We thank you, and we'll see you next time on the channel.